Welcome home to Radiant Life Church, where everyone counts. Thanks for joining us today for our online service. You know, in these prolonged seasons with the coronavirus and all the smoke in the air, we spend a lot of time inside, and and we don't get to do a lot of the things that maybe we normally get to do, which can increase our stress and anxiety and sometimes bring out the worst in people. But it also provides the opportunity to show our strength and our faith and our resolve. I have seen some people just this week who've really gone the extra mile, Mm -hmm. who have been courageous in sharing their love for their friends and their family. And, And it's been a great testimony that even when things are difficult, God is still at work in our lives. Yeah, so true. And we're so grateful that the air has cleared up and just to be able to step outside and get some of that fresh air, it's it's refreshing and it's refreshing to the soul, I think. Fresh air is refreshing. That's what you learned today. (laughs) You know, ladies, um, I want to let you know about an upcoming event. Our Sweet Life Experience is happening still here in 2020. Um, on Saturday, September 26th, and you need to go and register at ncnwomen.org. This year, the event is absolutely free, so there's no excuse for you not to participate. Um, Sign up today, ncnwomen.org, so that you can get the link to participate on Saturday, September 26th at 9 a.m. Absolutely, and there's still time to sign up to join me on a tour of the Holy Land, April 19th through the 30th of 2021. Maybe you're one of those people who's always wanted to walk in the footsteps of Jesus and and worship on the Sea of Galilee. Well, this is your chance. It's time to stop making excuses and just find out what it's all about. So if you'd like more information, go ahead and send an email to office at rlclodi.com and we'll send you more info on that. I'd love to have you join me. Yeah, you know, last week um, we took a look at Hebrews 10, 24, but I want to take a look a little bit closer at Hebrews 10, verse 23 today. It says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. You know, I think it's so important in these times to remember who we place our hope in. You know, we have hope in Christ. We have hope in eternal life. And when we set our eyes um, off of ourselves, off of circumstances, off of everything that seems to be um, crumbling before us, but when we set our eyes and fix them on Jesus, then we can hang on to the hope that we have in Christ And God's word tells us that he is faithful. His promises are faithful. Those don't change. Absolutely. You know, Jesus is our living hope. Mm -hmm. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the life. And we not only have eternal life through him, but we get to live life to the fullest today. Maybe you or someone you love has been struggling with depression or anxiety during this season. Maybe you just feel hopeless. We want to pray with you, and let's pray for those that we love and those who are closest to us who just need the hope of Jesus today. They need His light to shine into their lives. Would you bow your head with us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your love, and God, for that spark that you ignite in the heart of men and women. God, that reminds us that that you are the giver of life. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that for each one, whether they're part of our church family or or friends or coworkers, God, who are struggling during this season with maybe the sins of the past, maybe maybe the trap of depression or shame, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would breathe new life into them. And Father, as you do, God, as, as the wildfires on the West Coast are being put out, God, I pray that you would ignite a fire in us, that we would live passionately because you are our great and mighty God. Yes, Lord, we are so grateful for the very breath that we have to breathe. Lord, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would pour out your blessing on our church family today. God, may you just um, knit our hearts closer together. And Lord, I pray that you would meet everyone at their point of need today, God. May we continually fix our eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's take a few moments and just worship together with Grace and Russell. Hello, 
Radiant Life Church. It's um, so good to be back here with you. Uh, let's just go ahead and enter straight on in the worship. Jesus, thank you for this time. God, we thank you for this moment. And Father, we just ask that you would be in it. Whatever time or season that we may be in our lives, Jesus, whether it's good, bad, indifferent, somewhere in between, Jesus, you're there regardless. And Father, we thank you for that. And we just ask that you would just come right on down as we enter into worship. Thank you. May we pray. Amen. Before I call, before I ever cry, you answer me. can't outrun this heart I'm tethered to with every step I collide with you and like a tidal wave crashing over me rushing in to meet me here your love is fierce What does it mean to engage? If you grew up watching Star Trek The Next Generation, you know that Captain Picard, played by Patrick Stewart, used that word a lot. Often dramatically holding his finger in the air, he would lower his arm as he gave the command to engage. And it basically meant to do something, like go to warp speed, fire phasers, do the hokey pokey. <laughs> 
Well, usually not the hokey pokey. For those who are married or considering marriage, engagement is a period of moderate to high commitment leading up to the wedding day, usually marked by one or both parties wearing an engagement ring that may later be accompanied or replaced by a wedding band. The Encyclopedia Britannica says that the rules of engagement are military directives meant to describe the circumstances under which ground, naval, and air forces will enter into continued combat with opposing forces. And Webster's Dictionary offers nearly a dozen definitions of the verb engage, which include to offer as backing to a cause or aim, to expose to risk for the attainment or support of some end, to bind oneself to do something, to hold the attention of, or to deal with, especially at length. As followers of Jesus Christ, Radiant Life Church is compelled to engage our community, and we are compelled to engage in missions efforts, locally, nationally, and globally. This week, we turn our attention to the example of another of the first Christian missionaries who shared the good news of Jesus in the first century, a missionary evangelist named Philip. Let's turn to Acts chapter 8, where we begin reading at the latter part of verse 1. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Would you bow your head with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word that speaks to our hearts and lives today. We thank you for the examples of men and women of faith who, who were just ordinary people like us. But God, you use them in an extraordinary way because they were compelled to engage in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would remember that we too are compelled to engage in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. As a point of clarification, there were more than one man named Philip who served the Lord in the early church. You may remember Philip as a disciple who brought Nathanael to Jesus before the wedding feast in Cana. Or you may remember when Philip told Jesus that it would take more than half a year's wages to feed the crowd on the mountainside before Jesus miraculously fed the 5,000. But that is Philip who is now an apostle in Acts 8. Philip, the missionary evangelist, was one of the seven chosen to distribute food in Acts chapter 6. Philip was chosen along with Stephen, who became a martyr at the feet of Saul, after boldly and persuasively preaching that Jesus is Lord. When Stephen was stoned to death and Saul began persecuting Christians, even dragging them from their houses to be thrown in prison for their faith, Acts 8 tells us that Philip became a missionary evangelist who, who was called to engage with the marginalized. In Acts 8, 5, and 6, we read, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. Let's not miss the significance of Philip's mission field. He went down to a city in Samaria. First century racism, veiled as the pretense of piety, would normally compel a Jewish man like Philip to avoid Samaria at all costs. Maybe that's part of the reason that he headed there. After all, who would look for a Jewish follower of the way in a city in Samaria? Maybe the Holy Spirit worked through the panic of the moment to strategically place Philip in a place where there was such great need that miracles would abound and masses would come to Jesus. 
Jesus had also chosen to go to Samaria where he had a now famous conversation with a certain Samaritan woman at Jacob's well in the town of Sychar. Jesus was intentional to engage with the marginalized, even by defying social norms and deep racial divides. In John 4, 9, and 10, we read, The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So we see that our merciful and loving Savior had already shown his intention to share the gift of eternal life with the marginalized people of Samaria. In Matthew 25, Jesus delivered the parable of the sheep and goats, which suggests that his followers are compelled to engage with the marginalized. In Matthew 25, 37, we read, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Jesus punches a lot of hot buttons by saying that what we show our love for him when we feed the hungry, give a drink to the thirsty, invite strangers in, clothe the poor, care for the sick, visit those in prison. Whatever we do for one of the least of these, whom Jesus calls his brothers and sisters, we do for Jesus himself. The political and religious leaders of the first century marginalized Jesus to the point of crucifixion. But social status should not be a barrier when we are compelled to engage in Jesus' name. Jesus is the Savior of the world. And the missionary calling extends to the marginalized and to the influential. Yes, Philip also provides an example of engaging with influencers. Just a few verses later, beginning in Acts 8.26, we read, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kondake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Philip not only led the Ethiopian eunuch into a saving relationship with Jesus, the eunuch stopped his chariot and Philip baptized him in water as a public profession of his faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know what Philip expected when he obeyed the Holy Spirit and approached the chariot, but this missionary made quite an impression on a person of influence. In fact, the early church thrived in Ethiopia. Traditionally, a Greek-speaking missionary named Frumentius led King Inza to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ in the fourth century. But it is possible that this eunuch may have laid the foundation for the light of the world to shine in Ethiopia in the first century. Who knows how many he may have personally led to Jesus. When I pray with those who are facing medical challenges, I often pray that the Lord will help them minister to physicians and medical staff that they will encounter. Likewise, even when a person faces legal challenges, God can work through the worst circumstances to make an eternal impact when we are compelled to engage with influencers. In Luke 21, Jesus tells us to expect such obstacles to provide opportunities to bear testimony of His grace. 
Beginning in Luke 21, 12, we read, But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. And so, you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Most modern Christians lack the firsthand context for the kind of persecution that the family of God has faced since the first century. But we occasionally hear of reports of Christians, ministers, and missionaries who are raped, murdered, kidnapped, imprisoned, and even beheaded because they are compelled to engage in the name of Jesus. And somehow, the light of God shines brightly, even in the darkest moments. When we become more passionate about expressing the love of God than demanding our own comfort, our testimony can spark transformation in the hearts of kings, governors, CEOs, and influencers, as well as those they may sway. Have you ever noticed how competing companies and political adversaries tend to point out one another's flaws? Many items have been marketed as being better than the competition, and few politicians seem to be able to admit when they agree with their opponents on any topic. As followers of Jesus, we cannot lose sight of our common ground. In fact, when we stand on common ground, we tend to be more effective in every measurable way. Our church has made some small investments in advertising in the past few years. And I've often had to provide clarification when I'm told things like, no other church in Lodi is doing this, or you'll be ahead of your competition. We are not competing with any other Christian church. Our competition is the father of lies, who, who may entice people to lose everything at the gambling table, or, or drink their sorrows away in some dark corner, or make idols of sports figures and celebrities. So one might say that our competition is anything that distracts people from putting Jesus first in their lives. Again, churches are not in competition. We are allies. And Philip not only engaged with the marginalized and influential, but he was also compelled to engage with allies. In Acts 21, Paul led a group of traveling missionaries that included Luke, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit to author the book of Acts. In Acts 21, 8 and 9, we read, Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea, and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. This final update on Philip, the missionary evangelist, not only describes him as a host who engaged with allies in ministry, but it also touches on his legacy. While we don't read anything about Mrs. Philip, we know that their four daughters had the spiritual gift of prophecy. There's no doubt that Philip and his family joined arms with fellow missionaries, evangelists, and early pastors who led many to Jesus in Caesarea. Those who serve the Lord as missionaries often do so in places where their lives are in danger and they frequently feel isolated in their day-to-day -day work. At some point, we all ask if our efforts are making any impact because much of the work of the Lord is unseen. We may even feel underappreciated by others, which is why it is so important to draw strength from the Lord and engage with allies who are also compelled to engage. In Galatians 6, 9, and 10, we read, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest 
if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I like to say that Radiant Life Church doesn't just support missionaries with financial gifts, but missionaries are part of our extended family. We support missionaries through prayer, encouragement, and missions trips because we are compelled to engage with them as they engage in the work of the Lord. I pray that our missionary families know that they can count on Radiant Life Church to stand beside them no matter how difficult their mission field may be or how isolated they may feel. Our mission is to share life's journey through growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And supporting missionaries is part of that mission. The foundational passage of Scripture for this year's missions emphasis is Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. In the synagogue in Nazareth, Jesus told his hometown crowd that he is the one who fulfills this passage. As his followers, we are called to be like him in this way. That's a big task. If you've never made the decision to follow Jesus, then I want to give you the opportunity to take the first step in the right direction. Because it really is a step-by-step -step process of growing more and more like Jesus every day. If you're ready to take that first step, and I like to say that choosing to follow Jesus is as easy as A, B, C. The letter A stands for admit that you've sinned and ask God to forgive your sin. The letter B stands for believe that Jesus paid the price for your sin when he died on the cross. And the letter C stands for choose. And that's exactly what I'd like to invite you to do right now, to choose for yourself to follow Jesus. If you're ready to make that choice, then I would invite you to bow your head close your eyes and repeat this simple prayer after me. You can make it your own if you mean it. Dear Jesus, I know that you are good and I want you to be the Lord of my life. So I admit that I have sinned and I ask you to forgive my sin. Because I believe that you paid the price for my sin when you died on the cross. And so I choose to follow you today and tomorrow and each day throughout my life's journey. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life for taking away my sin and for making me a new creation. You are my risen Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, I want to invite you to send an email to prayer at rlclodi.com because we'd like to send you some free resources to help you as you take the next steps in the incredible journey of following Jesus. Here at Radiant Life Church, we like to say that everyone counts. That means that you are important to God and you matter to us. We're in this together. We are committed to sharing life's journey through growing relationship with Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. How sweet the sound that 
that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear in the hour I first believed my chains Shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God, who brought us me safe thus far, will be forever. Forever mine You are forever mine Cause my chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior Has ransomed me And like a fly Amazing grace Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in one. 
worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up Ha